Dr. Kearney, I don't remember a whole lot from anatomy block. <laughs> Sorry. I bet I, I, there is one thing I learned that fall, and that's it. When you're nervous, you can just close your eyes and do some kegels. <laughs> So, so everyone always asks me, what was it like to be homeschooled? Well, it was a blast. I actually got to study what I was interested in. Uh, I remember when I, was, when I was seven years old, I became fascinated with whales, humpback whales in particular. You know, they're incredibly long pectoral fins, they're majestic songs, they're migration patterns. I read everything I could. And a large por portion of that year I spent saving up my dollar a week allowances so that I could adopt this humpback whale named Colt. And they sent me videos of him and information on his habits and pictures of his pod. And I waited and I waited and I waited and he never came. <laughs> I had the pond below our house all ready for it. <laughs> but he never showed up. But it was a joy to learn because it was fueled by my childlike fascination of the world. And my parents were huge proponents of experiential education. And so every year I would find myself riding chicken buses around Guatemala or cycling across Montana. And I had no choice but to find ways to connect with people who were different from me in so many ways. And I can vividly remember how much the four of us little blonde-haired gringos stood out in rural Peru. <laughs> the Quechua women would come up and pinch the cheek of my little gringuito brother. And <laughs> before long, we'd find ourselves a part of whatever community we landed in. And I think it was in that environment that I learned one of my most valuable lessons about human connection. You know, we're, we're all walking around with barriers that we've constructed around ourselves, apparently to protect, uh, or protect ourselves from strangers. And, and these might manifest differently in New England than they do in North Carolina or New York from some rural Midwest town. But we all have them. And I'm absolutely fascinated by penetrating these barriers. I, I've learned that if you behave or you dress in a way that catches people by surprise or maybe makes them laugh, then they'll let down their guard for just long enough to maybe let you into their life. If any of you have ever traveled to another country on your own, you've probably experienced this phenomenon. It's perfectly set up for it because you're different in every way. But I've learned that we're in control of how we present ourselves in any environment. And when I wear a really silly hat and walk around with a big smile, the number of interactions that I have with strangers exponentially increases. And I think it's that phenomenon that first attracted me to clowning. <laughs> um, so I, uh, and in, in essence, clowning, people wonder what clowning is. It's, it's just imaginary play and silly improvisation. But uh, one story in particular comes to mind. It was several years ago, and it was on the sixth floor of the children's hospital. And I came across this boy that had been there for, for several months. And that afternoon, I spent a solid nine or ten minutes making an absolute fool of myself in his room, on his floor. I had a, a cape of a surgical gown. I ate hand sanitizer. I caught imaginary butterflies. He never cracked a smile. He, he stared at me the whole time, but he never let me in. And so I wound up, uh, you know, nine or ten minutes later in the hallway, and I was down to this pair of giant underwear. And so <laughs> I proceeded to wander around the sixth floor of the children's hospital collecting nurses and staff members until we had a record eight of us in these whitey tighties. <laughs> and we stumbled back into his room, and he was so surprised that he couldn't help but bowl over laughing. It was the first time I'd seen him laugh. And from that point on, it was no longer my performance. I had entered an imaginary world that we were both a part of. And it ceased to be effort. It was just play. <laughs> So 
So, since I started medical school, I've stopped clowning. Um, I've stopped clowning. And, uh, although many of you know, I still play the fool frequently. My dreams of connecting with patients seem to be fading as well. And, and I don't know when exactly I started to lose my idealism. But I can feel it, it slipping away. Um, I don't know, it's like, it's like I've got this, this blob of golden marmalade in my hand, and then I try to squeeze it, I try to hold on to it, and the more I squeeze, the more it just oozes out my clenched fist and splatters at my feet. And I, I still remember my first cut in anatomy lab, and how proud I was when I jabbed my fingers through the flesh and pulled traction so we could fillet open the back. And there was very little remorse and, and no reflection on my part. And it was an experience kind of like kayaking over a really large waterfall. You're a little bit nervous going into it. And then you near the edge and all of a sudden everything falls into focus. And the adrenaline's coursing through your body and every paddle stroke's following the last one and each cut crisscrosses and your scalpel's just going through the skin like butter. And it unsettled me that I didn't have more of an emotional response to that experience. And, and where was my humanity? Why didn't it disturb me that I was routinely mutilating a human corpse for the sake of my education? Um, and I think part of the answer lies in, in the minutia, perhaps. When, when we take apart a human body, we're so focused on naming and identifying each part that every entity becomes distinct and detached. And I think that that phenomenon is in part responsible for the loss of my idealism. I spend so much time engrossed in, in memorization and classification and isolation that I lose focus on the larger picture. And, you know, in, in CSD, we're, we're taught to always, always stand on the right side of the patient. And the voice comes over the intercom. You have 10 minutes remaining. You have five minutes remaining. Time is up. And I'm terrified. I'm really terrified that by the time I'm actually free to explore creative ways of connecting with patients on my own, I won't remember how. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I think that checklists are important in education and in reducing medical error, but I have so much more to offer patients than anything that can ever be checked in a box. One of the most rewarding experiences for me this year has been uh, meeting weekly with a group of students to explore compassion and self-awareness. And several weeks ago, I was just feeling so overwhelmed and burdened by everything we had going on. I went to this group and for an entire hour, <laughs> We sat there giving, giving each other hand massages and talking about our ideal magical dream practice. What a rejuvenating experience to know that those dreams are still there. They are. And I want, I want to know everything I can about human anatomy and biochemistry of the body. But I also want to know what motivates my patients and what terrifies them and what excites them, even if it means standing on their left side or standing in front of them or, or sitting cross-legged on the floor massaging their feet. I, I want to connect with people in a way that allows me to cease being the performer and to enter as a joint participant into an imaginary world. Thanks.